Okay, hi everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk today uh, called Open Source and Safety Critical Systems. How does that work? So I'm Simon and I work at Epix AI. In the last few years, shortly a bit about myself, in the last few years, I worked at Bosch, mainly as a, a software architect on radar-based driver assistance systems. And now at Epix, I'm a maintainer of Project Eclipse Isorix, and I work at our product, Epix Middleware. All right, first of all, I want to answer the question, what drives me? So I want to really look at that inside the box. I want to tear things apart, and then I can start building trust. And from my opinion, my opinion, this is especially important um, when it comes to safety software. And open source can provide this transparency where you can build up trust. All right, let's first have a look at the agenda. So I want to first talk about why is FOSS the right choice for safety critical systems. Then I'm going to briefly elaborate why processes are actually your friends and they can be beneficial. Then I want to talk about the typical automotive software development process and then jump into the next topic and tell you how one can safety certify free and open source software as safety element out of context. Safety element out of context is a term from the ISO standard, basically meaning there's certain assumptions when you certify your software. For example, you're not sure about the underlying hardware. And then I'm going to jump into the Eclipse ISRIX topic and see we have a look, going to have a look at how this is developed. Later on, I'm also going to talk about the impact that this development process has on the Eclipse ISRIX contributors. I'm going to conclude the talk with a brief outlook. All right, so why is FOSS the right choice for safety critical systems? I want to start with quoting Ross Anderson, leading security engineer at Cambridge University. And in his talk two years ago, he said the following, once you get software everywhere, safety and security become entangled. And I share this view because it doesn't really matter if a bug is a safety or a security bug, it's a bug, so just go fix it. And I think the safety community can learn a lot from the security community. For example, most of the security engineers today would always choose open source software over closed source software because it tends to be more secure. All right, let's have a look at the advantages of open source software in safety critical systems. So they tend to have better quality and less bugs, especially in larger projects. This is also sometimes called Linus law, basically meaning if lots of people look at a piece of code, um, it tends to have less bugs. You also get faster development with the support of the community and partners. And by this, you can share the development costs. And I don't mean here that you get features for free, but in the, in, 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 what I mean is industrial partnerships where you can share the costs between different companies. And if you're lucky in the end, you can also establish open standards. All right. Um, next up, I want to motivate why processes are actually your friends. So some open source developers might be critical of processes. Let me give you this example. So we have here a method. Um, this um, initializes, it creates an uninitialized bool. And based on the value of this bool, we either output true or false. And I will give you now some time to think about what the four possible outputs could be. All right, let's reveal the, uh, the answer. So if the compiler decides to initialize this bool with true, the output will be true. Or the other way around, um, false. The compiler can also say, hey, this bool is in an undefined state, so it leads to undefined behavior. And the output can be both true and false. The compiler can also say, hey, I'm optimizing this away, and then there will be no output. I have to admit, this is a theoretic example, so most compilers will get it right. But um, undefined behavior means anything can happen. And those kind of problems happen on a daily basis, and formal processes can help you to avoid these. All right. In the next chapter, let's have a look at a typical automotive software development process that is happening today. There's two um, standards that are rather similar, the ISO 26262 part 6, and ASPICE SWE. ASPICE stands for Automotive Software Process 
improvement and capability determination. And they both care about software development. Let's have a look at a brief example or walk through the, the V model here. Yeah, this is the interpretation in the automotive industry of the V model. You typically start with software requirement analysis. For example, for a middleware, this would be a requirement R2 executable able to exchange data. You break down this requirement, create your software architectural design, and then this design, implement this design at the lowest level and write the different software component and classes together with the detailed design. And then the other way up the Wii, you test this at these different levels. So you verify with software unit verification and unit tests that your software modules were written correctly. With integration tests, you test that against the software architectural design. And at the very uh, top, you test with software qualification tests and validate the actual requirements. And um, for example, in case of a middleware, you would now be able to answer the question, are two executables be able to exchange data? Okay, some people coming from the FOSS community uh, might now say, okay, this is incompatible with how FOSS is developed today. And in the next chapter, I want to show what we have done at Apex and how we have uh, safety certified a FOSS uh, project. All right, so how can one uh, certify FOSS, a safety element, out of context? First of all, and this is no matter, no matter if it's closed or open source software, we're going to have a look at um, what has to be done for ISO 26262 certification. And uh, this is not um, a complete list. It just should give a rough idea. So in the end, um, a certification should prevent hazards, malfunction or failures, and propose mitigations. And typically, you start with a so-called FMEA, a failure modes and effect analysis, an inductive analysis to control systematic failures. And to give you an idea what is contained in there, for example, it contains a risk priority number in order to prioritize the different modules. And this contains out of the severity, the occurrences, and the detection. So it's always about um, yeah, thinking about what can go wrong. Then you need to create a safety concept, write down the assumed use cases, do a ha hazard analysis and risk assessment, write down the requirements. Also classify and qualify the tools and throughout the whole process ensure traceability and change management. And establish a well, a, a very good and healthy safety culture. You also need to perform independent audits of both the code and the processes. All right, um, so we at Apex, we love ROS, the robotic operating system. This is a um, framework to develop robotics operations. And we saw big potential to certify it because most of the tier ones and OEMs in the automotive industry use it for their self-driving cars. And we ask ourselves, how can you certify this? Um, well, let's have a look at the facts. ROS2 has a large number of developers, about 1K in the main dist, uh, repository ROS distro. It also has a high momentum of changes. So in the last months, 273 pull requests were merged. And this would make it hard, like with a high change rate, this would make it hard to safety certify it in the open. And it also has established processes and an established working model um, together with the community. So um, basically it was set up 2009 and it would be hard for us to go there and say, hey, we have these, um, let's say, safety needs regarding our process. Can you change it? And additionally, it comes under a permissive Apache 2 license. So forking would be easy. And this is, was the conclusion in the end. Create a private fork because of these let's say limitations or because of these points and do ROS2, do the ROS2 certification in a private fork. All right, let's have a look. How did the certification lifecycle look like or how does it look like based of, uh, on ROS2 with our product OS. So first we created our internal fork. So what you see in the middle is the internal fork. And then we did all the different steps. We did the FMEA, we wrote down the requirements, we created the safety concept, and then looped over all the different components and looked at the, each of the components. And basically, additionally, on each of the components, did an FMEA, reduced the feature set, throw out a lot of code, 
um, did a static code analysis and wrote additional tests and tested on the hardware. And once this was done, we were able to release it together with a safety manual. And the safety manual contained things like, for example, the compiler flex. So an, a manual on what to do, how to use the software. And after the release, you typically can then deploy it, do an over-the-air update, and basically go into the field. And if there is a field incident, of course, you have to resolve and document this issue. And then we um, are upstreaming the patches. And um, of course, there can be also bug fixes, for example, in the upstream repository. And we also downstream these patches and then only certify the delta. And this synchronization between the internal fork and the upstream repository, this happens also throughout the development. So we very cautiously um, care about the user API so that they, they, they stay the same. All right, and yeah, March this year, uh, we received the following letter and the following certificate from TÜV Nord. So Apex OS based on ROS2 is ISO 26262, ASLD certified. And to our knowledge, this is the first and only open source project certified to the highest level of automotive safety. Cool, um, we've achieved that. Um, but we ask ourselves when uh, developing Eclipse Isorix, I will introduce it in a few slides. Um, does it always have to be like this? Yeah. Can we not develop safety software in the open? Um, and I want to talk about how we are developing Isorix in the next few slides. All right, so how is Eclipse Isorix developed? Before we dive into the details here, I want to briefly introduce uh, Eclipse Isorix to everyone. Um, Eclipse Isorix is a true zero copy interprocess communication middleware targeting safety critical applications. And the main feature is that the latency and the runtime, as you can see here on the right side, is independent from the message size. So it's super fast and made to transfer gigabytes of data on a single machine. But it's also flexible. It runs on many different operating systems and is already integrated into many different frameworks. It can also be used standalone. But it's at the same time also dependable, so it's developed according to automotive requirements. All right, so we want to use Eclipse Isorix in our safety product and we want to certify it at a safety product. So we asked ourselves, what are the differences now between ROS2 and Eclipse Isorix? And here, let's have a look at the facts again. So Eclipse Isorix compared to ROS2 has a very small number of maintainers, currently only 10 Eclipse committers, and they are the ones that approve and merge pull requests. So they are in control of the project. Also compared to ROS1, it has a reasonable code size on about 100K lines of code. And the difference is also it was developed with automotive safety in mind from the start. So for example, everything in Eclipse or most of the code in Eclipse Isorix is already memory static in order to avoid memory fragmentation and then out of memory problems. And additionally, the Eclipse Foundation provides a good setup and a development environment with established rules. And this is very helpful in such an environment. So the conclusion was, Let's develop and maintain Eclipse Isorix in the open together with the community. All right, um, let's have a look at the advantages. So if we develop Eclipse Isorix in the open, um, the most and most important advantage is, of course, we don't have two versions. Yeah, there's not this internal fork that we have to maintain, but there's only one version that is maintained, which is the upstream repository. So bugs are directly fixed upstream. And there's also no need for large refactorings or feature set reductions to throw out, for example, non-memory static code, because what we use in our product is the upstream code. And also, additionally, many documents and artifacts from the vModel are available in the upstream repository. For example, architectural documents, design decision documents. We also have a website where you can um, read the documentation and the API and basic unit and integration tests are also available in the public. Um, another advantage is that you can catch bugs early by running the tools in the CI. So for example, we partnered with Exivion to use their static code analysis tool 
on the public CI. And imagine now a, a student from university raises a pull request and he yeah, is not aware of certain rules. He will now see the CI read and um, yeah, has to adhere to the AutoSAR C14 rule set that we are using. Also, we run various Clang sanitizers, for example, address sanitizer or undefined behavior sanitizer. And now what you have to remember is the code alone is not enough to build a safety product based on Eclipse ISO rigs. So the mandatory certification artifacts are still the FMEA, the requirement elicitation, the MCDC test, the safety concepts, the safety manual, and other artifacts. And these artifacts, at least for our product, Apex Middleware, are not publicly available. All right, um, some developers now might say, okay, this sounds like a lot of paperwork, yeah? This is um, a lot of things to do. And I have to admit, yeah, you're completely right. Eclipse Isorix is not, um, uh, your your vanilla project, yeah, your normal project out there. So there is a price that you have to pay. And in the next chapter, I want to talk about this price that uh, we have to pay as developers and contributors. Okay, so in this section, let's talk about the impact that developing safety software in the open has on the Eclipse Isorix contributors. Let's jump into code, um, finally. Okay, here you can see um, a snippet from our vector class. So we're not using the standard library uh, vector because it uses the heap and we want to be memory static. And as you can see here, uh, there's a template parameter where you can um, uh, here at point one um, configure a fixed capacity and at two, this capacity is used in the underlying array. So the memory is completely static. There's no heap allocation. It's solely stack based. And this is a major difference to let's say other projects who are, for example, using the standard library vector. Additionally, I wanna have a look now at the um, access operator here. Um, and this access operator in the top calls the at method. And you can see here at point one that with every access, we check for out of bounds accesses. So also when adding this method is called, so no overflow is possible. Of course, this can be configured. Yeah, If you don't want this, for example, in the release um, a build, you can disable this for performance reasons, but we always suggest to have this active when, for example, testing. And Eclipse Isorix is also not using exceptions because this makes it very hard um, to test and to certify because exceptions can be thrown at various or at every um, line in the code. So all the methods are no accept and have the no accept specifier in their signature. And instead of exceptions, we use a concept inspired by Rust, the Rust result error handling concept, and we are very happy with it. All right, so to summarize, um, what do Isorix, um, uh, Eclipse Isorix contributors need to do? What, what, what is necessary? A healthy safety mindset is necessary. Yeah, always do defensive programming. Always expect the worst. What can go wrong? And also be as explicit as possible. So my favorite example here is when you initialize, for example, an unsigned integer, always use the unsigned literal behind the 42 here. This might this is controversial, I have to say, but this is just um, like, let's say it reminds the compiler to not make any mistakes and there cannot be a misunderstanding about the code here. But also keep in mind that certified doesn't equal safe. It's the best practice use in the industry. It's necessary, but not sufficient. Also, it is important to be familiar with coding guidelines, for example, MISRA. Um, so, for example, we don't allow undefined behavior. We don't allow dynamic memory allocation during runtime. And also, we tend to um, design APIs, especially the user APIs, easy to use and hard to misuse. As some of you might know Hiram's law. So if there's an API, um, it will always be misused if there's the possibility. And we want to avoid that, of course. And patience is necessary because pull requests take longer due to the in-depth reviews, more paperwork for traceability and checklist. And soon we'll also have this um, static code analysis tool run for every pull request. And this might slow down things as well. 
and the rigorous testing culture is necessary. So if we have the experience, if there's no test for a feature, it's definitely broken. All right, um, now I want to conclude the talk with a brief outlook. Um, so we plan the release 2.0 for Eclipse Isorix in quarter one, uh, 22, next year. The main features will be request response communication and the refactoring of the service discovery. And we also want to support our long-term stable version until April next year, mid-April next year. And um, we want to ISO 26262 certify our um, Apex middleware product, which is based partly on Eclipse Isorix. So in 22, um, you can expect a lot of patches. And additionally, we want to um, yeah, make our Isorix hoofs library more independent. And hoofs stands for handy objects optimized for safety. And what we have in mind is a lightweight standard library that is especially targeted for safety applications. So for example, the vector you saw previously is in this hoofs library. All right, um, so I'm, I'm done with the talk and I wanna conclude by um, welcoming you to fork Isorix on GitHub and to check it out. And also if you want to learn more about Isorix or check out the full API specification, um, you can check our website. And with the talk, um, I wanna thank you for listening and ask if there are any questions. Hi, welcome to the Q&A session. Um, so let me see, the first question is, how automated is the process of certifying ROS2 and how much manual work is involved? And that's a very good question. Um, so we at Apex, uh, when um, certifying um, Apex OS based on ROS2, we, we really love um, automation. So it's very, very important to have like um, most of the things like, for example, static code analysis or uh, we use a vector cast a tool from uh, the company Vector Informatic um, to do write our MCDC tests. And yeah, automation is the key. This is what I can say. And, and if you would have looked at our pipeline internally, this pipeline and the CI, it's really, it's really, it's really huge and it's probably one of the, the largest pipelines that I've seen so far. Okay, let's have a look at the second question. Uh, the second question is, are all documentation artifacts needed to support the safety process also available with Eclipse Isorix? Um, yeah, so um, as I um, mentioned uh, earlier, um, we um, are building our Apex middleware, or we're currently working on building our Apex middleware product um, based on both Eclipse Isorix and Eclipse Cyclone DDS. And for this, um, we are starting the certification work. Um, so currently regarding Eclipse Isorix, um, there's only few artifacts available um, and probably um, or very likely, so as I, as I pointed out, these artifacts will also not be publicly available. So um, what we try to do is make the code available. And uh, for commercial reasons, of course, um, the artifacts will be able to like um, buy, you will be able to buy the artifacts. Okay, um, the third question, if I understand correctly, the tests and certification artifacts are not open. Is it a lot of work to keep them in sync with the external contributions? What are reasons for not sharing them? Um, so I guess um, I'll start with the second part of the questions, the reasons for not sharing the certification artifacts, um, um, mainly commercial reasons. Um, and um, however, I have to point out also that we as Apex, um, definitely we are open to share these, so let's say a certification artifact. So this is definitely something that we could think about. Um, um, so please uh, just uh, drop us an email if you're interested in these kind of things and, and contact us. Um, regarding the first part of the question, um, we'll have to see um, once the certification work starts how to keep this in sync. And basically um, what we imagine is that uh, the, um, uh, the code or what we, what we do is we integrate the Git repository into our internal CI and basically always test against the upstream repository. And this so far is our recipe of how we want to really keep, let's say, internal tests or any kind of other in internal artifacts 
um, very like like up to date with what is in the upstream repository. And yeah, here again, the key of this is automation. So it needs to really a really good uh, uh, setup of the pipelines and the whole CI framework. Okay. Um, so the fourth question is, how frequently do you sync with the upstream ROS2 repository? Um, that's a very good question. So it's also hard to answer, to, to be honest. And I'm not involved in, in, in any kind of these, let's say, syncing. But what I've heard so far uh, from, my, from my colleagues is that this is happening throughout development. Yeah? And let's say, especially for tools, like for example, ROSBAC is a tool in order to record um, on what's happening if you're doing a test drive with a vehicle and things like this they get really um, um, let's say synced and and um, 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 synchronized a lot um, but yeah what, what what is important as i pointed out already is the um, synchronization of the user api yeah so the user api always needs to be like or we, we really take a lot of care about making the user API compatible. Um, but I would say like from a gut feeling here, probably there's some synchronizations um, happening like twice a month or three times a month, but it also depends on the, on the feature. But in general, um, lots of our um, developers are also contributing back to Rust 2. So this is very important for us to have this whole mentality of, let's say, contributing back to the community. Okay, um, the next question, um, what's your relation to OpenADX Working Group? Is Isorix part of it? Yeah, actually, Isorix is part of the OpenADX um, Working Group. And the relation is such that um, Bosch decided to, um, in 2019, to open source um, Isorix um, in order to foster the whole OpenADX landscape. And OpenADX has this um, purpose or the goal of fostering the whole, um, let's say, frameworks or the whole tooling landscape, uh, what is there um, in order to really also foster automated driving and to also maybe establish open standards here. So um, definitely um, open, we, sh we, are, we at the, as Eclipse Isorix contributors, we share the goals and the aims of OpenADX. Okay. Um, what I wanted to also mention, this is maybe interesting to uh, some of the uh, Eclipse um, uh, uh, contributors or from the Eclipse Foundation is like um, an idea that we had um, when developing Eclipse Isorix is also um, that we could think about, for example, um, extending the Eclipse Handbook um, a bit in regards to doing, let's say, safety software. Yeah? So the Eclipse Handbook, as I pointed out, does already um, have a lot of, let's say, rules that can be very helpful, especially if you are developing open source, let's say, in a corporate environment. And yeah, why not um, going further there? And if this will turn out to be a, let's say, future focus of the Eclipse Foundation, and also with together with OpenADX, for example, why not extend or maybe modify the handbook, the Eclipse handbook, and go with this way forward and provide more, let's say, um, yeah, in the end, um, process security, or you know what I mean, like to, to, to give more guidelines for this, uh, let's say, special field of, of safety software. So this is something that I uh, would really like to talk about. If anyone is interested, um, please go ahead and, and just uh, ping me there and, um, yeah, if you also have other questions, of course, you can um, uh, don't hesitate to contact either me or also um, Apex AI, also if you're interested in, in any kind of the things that we do. All right. I don't think there's any further questions. So let's wrap this up. Thanks, everyone, for listening and have a nice day.